sort of very special because if I mutate the vertex one, then I'm going to get a quiver which is isomorphic to Q. Okay. It is obtained from Q by a 72 degree rotation counterclockwise. So, you know, see that. so, and this is precisely the setting in which the T system is defined. So, to give a precise definition, you have we start with a quiver and some sequence of mutations that produces a quiver isomorphic to Q. Then you start with some variables at the vertices, and then you mutate to get some rational functions of the vert on the vertices of the quiver isomorphic to Q. So you just use this isomorphism to relabel the, the rational functions, and then you just repeat this whole procedure. So the T system is a discrete dynamical system which consists of iterating a certain map. In this case, the map is going to be. <laughs> map can stand x1, x2, uh, x5, to x2, x3, x4, x5, I'm not sure if you can see that, uh, x3, x4, plus x2, x5, over x5. Okay. So that's the map in this case, so it's, it reduces to the sum of 5 sequence, if you know what that is. But yeah, so I want I want to study these T systems, but not just arbitrary ones. I want to study bipartite T systems. So the bipartite T system, it, you start with a bipartite quiver. Bipartite quiver. So the vertices are colored white and black, so that every arrow points either from white to black or from black to white just like in the picture on the screen. And then what I want to do is I want to mutate all the white vertices and then all the black vertices and just keep doing that. But the problem is that if I, because you can see that the mutation, the mutations at two vertices that are not adjacent to each other, they commute with each other. So it is well defined to mutate all the white vertices in any order, the order doesn't matter. But the problem is that if I just take any bipartite quiver and mutate all the white vertices, then I might get, I might not get a bipartite quiver at the end. Right? I, I might get some arrows, arrows between black vertices, and then it's going to be bad. So I want to make a definition of this uh, special class of quivers. A definition slash proposition, which I, this is going to be the, main, the most important definition of this talk. So uh, let Q be a by our side. all the black vertices and I'm going to go back to my initial quiver. So this is the condition that I need in order for the bipartite system to be defined for my quiver. And then this condition is kind of not very explicit. So if you just use the definition of a quiver mutation, then you're going to get the following kind of equivalent way of saying this, is that for any two vertices u and v of your quiver, the number of paths of length 2 from u to d should be equal to the number of paths of length 2 from d to u. And that's the condition shown on the screen, so here's your u and v, and then you have k paths from u to d, and then k paths from d to u. Right? And so what happens if you mutate all the white vertices, then you mutate the first k of them, you create k arrows from u to v. And then you mutate the last k vertices, you create k shortcuts back from v to u, and they cancel each other out. So you don't get any new black, any new arrows between the u and v vertices. Okay. Are, one and two, are one and two supposed to be shortcuts? Uh, yeah, one and two. Uh, one and two. Oh, sorry. Yeah, yeah, that's part of the proposition. 
And finally, this condition is very combinatorial and it's very easy to check for a given quiver. But I want to make it more algebraic. And so let me, well, I have arrows of two types. Right? So let me color them into different colors. This is going to be red and this is going to be blue, just like on the screen. And then the third condition is that, let me write it down like this. A, B, A times B equals to B times A, where A is the red adjacency matrix and B is the blue adjacency matrix. Right? So if you know the colors of the edges, then you can forget about the orientation and just look at the undirected edges of two colors. And then A is just the n by n, where n is the number of vertices, and n by n adjacency matrix. So when you multiply <coughs> these two together, this counts the, like, the number of red blue paths from U to B. And this counts now a blue red path from U to B. So that proves that this condition is equivalent to the second condition. Yeah. So whichever one of those you prefer. And if the quiver satisfies any of these conditions, then I'm going to call it recurrent. recurrent. So the, the conclusion is that the bipartite the system is defined for the class of bipartite recurrent quivers. For other quivers, it's not, it's, it just doesn't make sense. Okay. So, and then you start with the bipartite recurrent quiver, so something like this. You can check that using any of those conditions that it's bipartite recurrent. And then you mutate all the white vertices. So you get something like this, right? D gets replaced by, I'm using this formula here. So D gets replaced by C plus B F over D. And then I mutate all the black vertices, so I get something like this. Right? Again, B gets replaced by the sum of these two things over D. And so far I'm getting Laurent polynomials, so there is no, there's only a monomial in the denominator. And it's so far it's trivial to see, but then the claim, the theorem of Fomin and Zelowinski tells you that. I'm always going to get Laurent polynomials in this case. So in the right hand you have an uh, opposite quiver? Yeah. Uh, I mean, well, yeah, I'm just I'm just going to forget about the orientations oh, because okay. the quiver doesn't change, but yeah, I should I should reverse all the arrows. But okay. because it's recurrent, I, I can forget about those. Mm -hmm. And then the claim of Fomin and Zelensky tells you that if you, let's say you mutate the white vertices again, so B plus C, is going to cancel out, right? If you replace this guy by the sum of these two things over, over this, and then B plus C is not going to appear in the denominator. There's going to be no plus signs in, in the denominator. Okay. So, right, I've given you a definition, and then I want to play with some examples. And as you play with examples, you're going to see that all the bipartite recurrent quivers somehow split into four classes, and inside each class, the behavior is very similar, but across different classes it's, it's different. You can easily see the difference. And here are the names of these classes. So far I'm not going to tell you what those are. I'm going to tell you later. But I, I just want to try an example from each class and see what, what's the behavior in this case. So let's say I try a finite times finite clue, which is like an oriented square. And I'm supposed to start with the seed, so independent algebraically independent variables, but then I set them all equal to 1 for simplicity. And so let's mutate. Let's say I mutate the white vertices and I get I replace 1 by 1 plus 1 over 1. That's a 2. And then I mutate the black vertices, I get 2 plus 2 over 1. That's a 4. And I mutate the white vertices, I get 4 plus 4 over 2. That's a 4. Now I mutate the black vertices, I get 4 plus 4 over 4. That's a 2. I get 2 plus 2 over 4, that's a 1. And finally, I mutate the black words, I get 1 plus 1 over 2. So I go back to my initial, my initial data by some miracle. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to record the results of my experiment. So I'm just going to write down finite times finite. I'm going to write down periodic. Okay. 
I'm not giving you any theorems. I'm just saying that in this, for an example of this class, we have observed some derivatives. And then let me try and a fine times fine equivalent, something like, let's say I take this double arrow, and then if I start with the seed, I mutate the y vertex, let's say this 6, 1, x2, I mutate the y vertex, I get x2 squared, because there's two red arrows, plus 1, because there's no blue arrows, over x1. Okay. So I could denote this guy by x3, and then I get just like a sequence of, well, I get a sequence defined by this recurrent relation, xn plus 1 is equal to xn squared plus 1 over x and minus 1. So if I set x1 and x2 equal to 1, then what I'm going to see is uh, I mean take the 1, I get 1 squared plus 1 over 1, that's 2, and then 2 squared plus 1 over 1, that's a 5, and 25 plus 1 over 2, that's 13. So, yeah, and then I need to take 169 plus 1 over 5, that's 34. I'm getting integers because of the Laurent phenomenon. So, yeah, I can keep going, and I, mean, I get some numbers. So, my xn sequence is equal to 1, 2, 5, 13, 34, etc. And you might recognize these numbers as the every second Fibonacci number. So, they satisfy the linear recurrence, and this one here. So. Again, a miracle, instead of this quadratic <laughs> recurrence with some division, I just get a linear recurrence. 3xn minus xn minus 1. So in the affine times finite case, I'm going to write down linear recurrence. This is just just experiments. I'm just playing around with I'm gonna tell you all the theorems later. Now I wanna try a fine terms of fine quiver. And again, I start with double ones, I mutate the libraries, I get one squared plus one squared over one, that's a two, and then two squared plus two squared over one, that's an eight. These are gonna be powers of two. So two to the sixth plus two to the sixth over two, that's two to the sixth. I keep going, and, and these exponents 1, 3, 6, 10, 15 that I'm getting are the triangular numbers. So the formula is 2 to the edges 2. And this sequence is not linearizable. Linearizable sequences, they grow exponentially, and this grows quadratic exponentially. Right? And that's just going to be the condition that I'm going to write down here. In that time, Case. I'm going to write down grows quadratic exponentially. Okay. And finally, let me try a wild example. Like, let's say I take this triple arrow here, and I start with x1, x2, and it is going to be almost the same sequence as this one, but except that, except for a square, I'm going to get a cube because there's three red arrows. And now, if you try the computation, start with one and one, and you take one cube plus one over one, that's a two, so that's good. But then two cube plus one over one, that's a nine. Nine cube plus one over two, can, can you do this? Nine, nine cube is 729 plus one over two, that's 365. I mean, I'm, I'm gonna keep going, I'm gonna get these numbers here, and if you, so the sequence is 1, 2, 9, 365. If you look it up in the OEIS, <laughs> the next number is this guy. Is this guy here. Yes. And the next one after that has 129, 20, 121 digits. <laughs> so the number of digits grows exponentially. And the sequence itself, it grows while it grows doubly exponentially, which means x. Now I have this experiment, so I wanna now I wanna tell you the conjecture that describes the behavior of the bipartite system for all bipartite recurrent coolers. And so far I didn't tell you anything about Dinkin diagrams, but then all of a sudden I need those to define my classes of coolers. So the here is a reminder slide about Dinkin diagrams. 
and uh, you all probably know about that. So there's a party today. Can I, can I erase this party thing? Yeah. Yeah. So, um, well, Ethereum of Winberg is what, what I want to tell you, because that's, uh, that's going to play a role later. So Ethereum, Winberg, 1970, tells you a characterization of fine, of fine Linkin diagrams as follows. So, G, B, graph, just the under the graph, then, uh, G is an affine Jenkins diagram. If and only if G has an additive function, has an additive function. By definition, an additive function is a function nu from the vertices of G to positive real numbers, such that twice the value of the vertex is equal to the sum of all of its neighbors. Okay. For all this is for all vertices V. For example, 4 is equal to 3 plus 1, and 8 is equal to 2 plus 3 plus 3, and 12 is equal to 3 plus 4 plus 5. And the theorem is that the graphs on the right are the only graphs with this condition, with these additive conditions. <coughs> and if you want to characterize finite in diagrams, then you can say, okay, instead of a fine, I can, I can say finite. Additive, I'm going to say some additive, and instead of equality, I'm going to have strict inequality. Okay, and this characterizes finite linking diagrams on the left. So I'm only doing AD linking diagrams, all simply raised. Right. Well, now here is the definition of all of my classes of quivers. Let me give a definition for say a finite and finite quivers, the rest are very similar. So a bipartite recurrent quiver. Q is called a finite and finite quiver. If if the following two conditions are satisfied. So one is that the red components are affine little diagrams. And the blue components, the blue components are finite. If your quiver satisfies just these three conditions, then I'm going to call it a fine times finite quiver. And similarly, a finite times finite quiver is a bipartite recurrent quiver such that the red and the blue components are finite linking diagrams. So that's only for a bipartite recurrent quiver, the only restriction is on the red and blue connected components. And so this defines the three classes above, and by definition, a wild quiver is a bipartite recurrent quiver size that, that doesn't belong to any of the first three classes. Now here's a conjecture based on, well, I mean, first of all, observe that indeed these are finite times finite, these are a finite times finite, this is a finite times finite, and this is a wild quiver because it has a triple arrow, which is not a Dimpton diagram. And then the conjecture, based on our very limited computational evidence here, is that given a bipartite recurrent quiver, the bipartite system is periodic, 
if and only if your cooler is finite times finite, and it's linearizable, if and only if your cooler belongs to one of the first two classes, then the T system is, it grows quadratic exponentially, if and only if you have an affine times affine cooler, and finally, for all wild cooers, it should grow double exponentially. What's the definition of wild? Uh, a wild cooler is a bipartite recurrent cooler, which does not belong to any of those two systems. So it's it's completely general statement that uh, other graph always uh, grows as extremes. This is the, this is statement for all bipartite recurrent cooers. Okay, that's a very optimistic conjecture based on some. Well, I mean, maybe that's not enough evidence. But let me tell you about the results. First of all, the periodicity story is completed. So, bipartite recurrent cooler is finite times finite, if and only if the T-system is periodic. And then, I'm going to talk about this theorem for the rest of this talk, but let me just tell you the other results for other classes, which are not as nice, I think. So first of all... Can I just ask a question? Yeah. How does that fit into the uh, classification of finite cross-trailers? Uh, so... Right, so... Um, if you just let all the uh, all the let's see what I can erase. You just make all the edges of the same color. Your Dinkin diagram. So let's say you take a type D Dinkin diagram where every edge is either a source or well, every vertex is either a source or a sink. Then this is, an this is a finite times finite cooler, okay? Uh -huh. Because it, it just has one red connect component, so it's a finite in the diagram. And all the blue components are just single vertices. But so each, each one of your finite tensor finite is one of the vertices. Yeah. Each one of your finite tensor finite is one of the ADE. Uh, no, no, there's going to be. Uh, so I'm yeah. Not, I'm not understanding your statement. So the finite. So the Cluster algebras are characterized by thinking diagrams of finite type. Yes, so the finite type cluster algebra is where you can make any mutation sequence, any apply any mutations, and then you, you're going to get oh, finite. not any, you're just... Yes, and then bipartite mutations. And then, but, but I mean, it's a good question of what are these finite times finite quivers, and the answer is very nice. I'm going to tell you at the end, but yeah, before that, let me tell you about the other two classes of quivers. So the next theorem is that we can only do one direction if your T system is linearizable, meaning that if you, fix any, if you pick any vertex and then the values of the T system satisfy linear recurrence of these vertices. Then your quiver has to belong to one of the first two classes. And then the third theorem is that if your T system grows slower than this very, very fast rate of growth, then your cooler actually has to belong to one of these three classes. So for all the wild quivers, we have proven that the system grows very fast. So the only two things left from that conjecture from the previous slide are the following. I give you an affine times finite cooler. How do you prove that the T system is linearizable? That seems kind of tricky. And the other, the other question is that I give you an affine times affine cooler, show that the T system grows quadratic exponentially. So, yeah, but for this talk, I'm only going to speak about the first theorem. And it has a very long history, which I'm going to recall now. So, here's the definition of a tensor product. I'm going to take, if you can take any two bipartite undirected graphs and then make it into a bipartite recurrent quiver using the following construction. So, I'm going to take, let's say I take Z5 and A3 Dinkin diagrams, then the first thing you do, you just take the direct product of graphs, something like this, and then you orient all the edges like this. So you want to make every square kind of oriented, but the precise way of saying, of saying that is to use this, you remember the colors of edges, they allow you to reconstruct the orientations. So I can tell you just, I just tell you, 
color all the D5 components red and all the A3 components blue. <coughs> and this gives you the orientation that you need. So that's the tensor product. And then a theorem of Keller is saying that if you take a tensor product of two finite Lincoln diagrams, then the T-system is going to be periodic. Okay. It was proven in 2013, but it was conjectured before I was born in Bismologikov in 91 <laughs> for single Lincoln diagrams. Right, so lambda denotes a finite Lincoln diagram. And then two years later, it was conjectured by Ravanini, Tatel, and Valeriani for tensor products of two Lincoln diagrams. And then two years later, it was proven by Frank and Zanish for a, like a path. It just had a single red path with no blue edges, just something like this. And then later, it was proven by Pamina Zelensky for any like, single red diagram because they did the finite type classification. Yeah. And finally, it was proven by Volkov for the case of a rectangle. And here you have red and blue edges. And then it was resolved by Keller in full generality. And also, there is a very nice, well, I mean, there is a very nice expression for the period of your T system which involves the Coxter number. You all, I mean, it seems like the other speakers assume this as a, as a prerequisite, so I'm not going to define the Coxter number, but let me just write down this as a table. If you don't know what it is, then consider this table as a definition. E6, E7, and E8. For AN, it's equal to N plus 1. For TM, it's 2M minus 2. For E6, it's 12, and then 18, and then 30. Okay. And yeah, it's the period of the Coxter element and define the Coxter group. What? That's one definition. So now the theorem is that the T system is periodic, and the period divides this 2 times h plus h prime, where h is the Coxter number of the red Dinkin diagram, and h prime is the Coxter number of the blue Dinkin diagram. For example, for the square that we have here, we have A2 and A2, so the period should be dividing 2 times 3 plus 3, which is equal to 12. And we saw that after 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 steps, we went back to the initial conditions, so 6 divides 12, which is good, but actually, if you started with some variables and vertices, then after six steps you wouldn't go back, you would get back to a 180 degree rotation of that. So it would take you six more steps to go back. And the actual period is indeed 12 in this case. Yeah. So now, how is this theorem a history of our theorem? Well, it's a special case of our theorem because all the tensor products are to satisfy this definition. And they're vibratory current covers such that the red and blue components are, for, for trivial reasons, they are finite in the diagrams. And then, like, the good question is whether these are the only quivers that we get, or does this finite times finite class involve some other quivers? And, yeah, I'm not telling the answer yet, but it's going to be good news for us later. And instead, let me tell you about this theorem kind of in more detail. So. What I want to do is, I want to expand it into five equivalent conditions. And they're going to be arranged, like the last one is going to be the hardest one to check. If I give you a quiver, it's very hard to check whether the system is periodic, because you have to make all these computations with Laurent polynomials, and it takes a very long time. So the previous condition is that the tropical T system is periodic. So let me define the tropical T system for you. Let's erase this. Okay, so instead of doing the usual mutations, you do tropical mutations. So you start with the map lambda from the vertices of your ruler to arbitrary real numbers. Then, when you apply the tropical mutation at the 
minus b. What you do is you replace lambda sub b with the maximum of the sum of income narrows lambda sub u and the sum of outgo narrows lambda sub w minus lambda sub b. Okay. So this expression is a tropicalization of this expression. And if you don't know what tropicalization is, I'm going to tell you some intuition. So the tropicalization, whenever you have an expression, we call the subtraction free expression without any minus signs, then the tropicalization replaces multiplication, division, and plus with addition, subtraction, and taking the maximum. And like, think about polynomials. If you multiply two polynomials, then their degrees add, add up together. If you divide two polynomials and get a polynomial, then the degrees, the degree of the result is the degree of the first one minus the degree of the second one. If you add two polynomials and the coefficients are positive, then the degree is going to be the maximum of their, of their degrees. So the tropical T system tells you about the degrees of polynomials polynomials that appear in the usual T system. And the more precise statement is that it contains the full information about the Newton polytopes of those Laurent polynomials. If you don't know what it is, that's fine. Excuse me, uh, can you put this statement for for very deep for any any quiver or just for bipart I do recall? I mean, uh, equivalence of four. Um so I think yeah I think we can prove it for any bipartite recurrent quiver using there is a theorem that the cluster monomials form a basis are uh, linearly dependent. Oh, you use that. If, but we do not use that. Well, you don't because, because yeah, yeah. But using that, you can prove it for any bipartite recurrent. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Quiver. But for our special quivers, it's enough to use the third statement. Uh, use some special information. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Now, well, let me give you an example for this tropical periodicity. So. Again, if I take a square, but now I'm allowed to take any real numbers as my initial data. So I mutate the white words, so I get the maximum of these two guys, minus zero, so I get one. And then I take the maximum of one and one, minus zero, which is one. So then the maximum of one and zero minus one, this is zero. The maximum of zero and zero minus one is minus one. The maximum of zero and minus one minus zero is zero, and finally, the maximum of 0 and 0 minus minus 1 is not where I started with, but a 180 degree rotation of that. You see? So after, after six more steps, I will go back. So that's tropical periodicity. And now, the difference between these two guys is tropical cal computations are very, very easy to do on a computer. They are very fast. You just have to do some piecewise linear operations, and it takes way less time. Yeah. But but you have to do it for any initial value, which is kind of infinitely many conditions, which is not good. So the third condition is that Q has a fixed point. And what is a fixed point? Uh, let me let me write it down. So a fixed point. bunch of values x of b satisfying the following equations. x of b is equal to the sum, is equal to the sum over, over all income narrows x of u plus the sum over all outgoing arrows x of w over x of b. Okay. So it's an assignment of numbers such that it stays the same under mutations. You mutate all the white words, you get just the same numbers. Then you mutate all the black words, you get the same numbers again. So that's a fixed point of your T system. And for example, for like this is a bipartite recurrent quiver, and yeah, you want to solve a system of equations like this. Right? So any squared, the system of equations is x squared, x b squared is equal to the sum of these two guys. Right? And then here are the equations that you need to solve in this case, and Here's the solution. You can check that like a squared 
is it equal to B plus B? So for the fixed point, those are sums, not products? Uh, no, that, oh, oh, sorry about that. No, no, no. <laughs> Thank you so much. That's totally confusing. Yeah, so exactly the same formula here. You mutate to get the same values. The uh, xv is a real positive number. You yeah, so I'm, I'm assuming that x and b should be greater than 1. I see. That's like a technical assumption, uh, but yeah, I see. with this assumption, uh, the theorem works. Yeah. Without that, it doesn't work. You get some other quivers. It's a Q system, right? Uh, yeah. I mean, this fixed point means a solution in the Q system. Yeah. Well, well, in our, in our <laughs> terminal <laughs> systems. Yes, yeah, so actually, for Q systems, I think the Q systems are like special cases for a, for a fine transparent theory, so far, right? Because yeah, the, this, the, just this equation here, just this particular equation is exactly yeah. the system. Well, I mean, well, we we understand. Just the time evolution. Just this, this is not the time. This is not time evolution of something, right? It's just no, it's not. No, it's it's the Q system with okay. the plus sign that they were discussing earlier. Yeah, it's yeah, but, but, but I can tell you, I can tell you more about this. So if you take. Your Q system is defined for any identity diagram. Yeah. Right? So if I take, let's say I take I know, D5, then I can take a quiver, which looks like this. No, okay, this should be. This should be blue. Uh, a quiver that looks like this. And then a quiver, well, it's probably the same quiver. And the yeah. uh, that's, that's the quiver for which your Q system yeah. is defined, right? And that's an affine times finite quiver that's right. from our classification. Yeah, I just want to say that this seems to be related to the previous talk. So your, your integrability is, is kind of related yeah. to our integrability. But we, we are talking about a little bit perspective, but that's okay. Yeah, okay. but, but, but okay. you have to be the minus sign. Okay, no, no, <laughs> but, but, okay. Uh, yeah, so that's the fixed point. How do you know you can solve such a thing? Why do you say this is easier? Um, okay, yeah, I mean, that's a good point. I can solve this particular system of yeah, equations. Yeah, 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 but of course, if I try my computer, then at some point it's going to break and not be able to solve. Yeah, so. But I mean, it's, it's a good question whether this is easier than just writing the computation for I don't know which one is easier. This one seems easier for me, but I, I, don't, I just tried this many times and I always I failed for all the viewers very, very badly. So now here is the very easy condition to check. Q has a strictly subiotic labeling. So this is going to be an analog of Winberg's theorem here. Okay, if a strictly, strictly subiotic labeling is, oh, let me, what should there is? Strict subiotic labeling is a, is a function mu of the right your quiver to positive real numbers such that twice the value of the vertex is bigger than the maximum of the sum of incoming arrows and the sum of outgoing arrows. Okay, so this is kind of like a bicolor version of the Winders theorem because here we have all edges of the same color, so we just have one condition, one strip of But if you have edges of two colors, you want uh, yeah, you want you want twice the value bigger than the sum of red neighbors and the sum of blue neighbors. So for this quiver, the system of equation of inequalities I need to solve right now is it looks like this, right? So twice the value of B is bigger than the maximum of A plus A and C. And yeah, there is many solutions, one of them is two, three, four. You can check that it works. Uh, 
So there's like a, a strict similarity function for our binary times finite quiver. And finally, the last condition is that it's the easiest to check. Right? You just look at the red and blue components. All of them should be finite different diagrams. And well, based on this definition, because we have assumed already that Q is bipartite current, this condition can be replaced by just saying that Q is a finite times finite quiver. Okay. That's the easiest condition to check. And now, now let, let me go back to this question of whether finite and finite quivers are all tensor products or do we get something else? The answer is yes, we do something else. We do get something else. There's a finite times finite quiver, which is not a tensor product. So let me check the definition for you. First of all, you look at the red components. These are like K9 and D6. So component means connected component. Yes, yeah. Yeah. you remove all the blue edges and you look at what's left. Okay, and now if you look at the blue components, they are A5 and D4. And now you, I mean, that's all good, but you also need to check that it's a bipartite recurrent quiver. So, but going back to this definition which I raised is that you need to take all pairs of, like you take a pair of U and B and then you check that the number of paths of line 2 from U to B is equal to the number of paths of line 2 from B to U. You do it for all pairs of vertices and you indeed check that this is a finite times finite quiver, which is not a tensor product because, well, I mean, it has different red components, which is impossible for tensor products. So, okay, at least we get some new results about periodicity and, well, what about the period of the T system? Because now, remember, there was two times H plus H prime, but now it's not clear what's H and H prime, but the, <laughs> the claim is that still the period divides two times H plus H prime, where now H is the, the miracle here that happens is that for all such quivers, the, all the red components have the same constant number. Let me show you how it works. If you look at the red components, then you have A9, which has constant number 9 plus 1, and D6 has constant number 12 minus 2, and both of those are equal to 10. And then the blue components, this is A5, constant number 6, and this is D4, constant number 8 minus 2. So the period in this case should be equal to 2 times 10 plus 6, which is 32. So our theorem tells you that this, for this quiver, you run the system after the third two steps, you go back to the initial values. And yeah. So now, but now we have a question like, so these are, these involve tens of products, but also some other quivers. It would be nice to have like some understanding, maybe some list of these quivers or something. And it turns out that these quivers have been classified and not even by us, by someone else, by John Stambridge in 2010. He was doing some cartan theory and what he was classifying are pairs of commuting cartan matrices. Okay, so if you if you remember the definition of a bipartite recurrent quiver, one of the conditions was saying that A and B was equal to the A, where A and B are the red and blue adjacency matrices. And now this condition of being a bipartite recurrent quiver tells you that uh, the red and blue components are finite in diagrams, so like two times the identity minus A and two times the identity minus B should be Cartan matrices, which are not necessarily reduced Cartan matrices. Yeah, so the, the point is that he was classifying exactly the same objects and he got five infinite families one of them being tensor products, but he got four other families. The other one I showed you in front of the previous slide. And he also got 11 exceptional quivers. That's the biggest exceptional quiver that he got. If you look at the blue components, these are four copies of the eight. Mm -hmm. okay. And by symmetry, the red components are also four copies of the eight. And they're glued in such a way that this is a bipartite recurrent quiver. So by our theorem, for this quiver, 
the T system is going to be periodic with period 2 times 30 plus 30, which is 120. Which would be very hard to check computationally. And now, for the rest 10 minutes of this talk, I want to tell you a little bit about the proofs, the proof of our results. You know, so, in the uh, original work of assemblies, any periods still play some role? Um, I don't, I don't think so. You know, here are specifying W admissible W graphs, mm -hmm. and uh, I, I, we were trying to deduce periodicity from his work, and we couldn't find the like the direct connection. Nice. So, in our proof, we had to. Well, I mean, the, proof, the theorem has five conditions, and they're all equivalent to each other. So, what you want to do is you want to prove this in, in the optimal way, and it turns out that for us the optimal way was this one here. So uh, you can even check that from any condition, you can go to any other condition by following the arrows. And yeah, and in fact, all the arrows here, all the arrows except for one of them, are very easy to prove. Right? So for example, like to go from here to here, you just take the logarithm or exponentiate. To go between these two guys, you basically apply the Winberg's theorem together with the parent for Venus theorem. To go from here to here, you just tropicalize. And they, this is kind of a tricky part, which you asked me about, which is um, if, we, if we know tropical periodicity, then we know that after, after we wait for a period, we're going to get a single monomial. But then the fixed point tells you that the coefficient must be the same as well. So. Yeah, I combine these two things and I get T system periodicity. And the only hard arrow is this one. And for this arrow, we have to use, we do not reproof Keller's result, we have to use it. And we somehow reduce the tropical periodicity for all quivers from standard classification to those of tensor products. Okay, so we use Keller's theorem, cluster categorification stuff, and we also use standard classification in a very specific way. Um, yes. So let me kind of explain how the proof goes. Now let's say you wanna let's say you have you know about type D that it, the tropical T system is periodic. And you want to prove that for type A the tropical T system is periodic. Or you want to go the other way around, it doesn't matter. So uh, let's instead of proving periodicity for any initial values, let me prove the periodicity for the values that are symmetric with respect to the involution uh, of this type A guy. And I wanna I wanna apply a certain map which we call duality between these two Dindy diagrams. So whenever you have an involution, you you can transform your Dindy diagram into another one by gluing these vertices together and splitting these vertices into two different ones. Right? So every vertex that's fixed by your involution you make two copies of those. And if the verses are not fixed, then you then you glue them together. Uh, yeah. So, and then you just change the values. If there is two a, then you put a and a here, and then you, when you glue the b's, you just glue them together. And the point is that this duality operation commutes with taking truck permutations. Okay. So. Either you can first apply truck permutation to all white vertices, and then take the duality. Or you can apply the duality and then apply truck permutations. This, this is going to give you the same result. Right? So again, when I split this vertex into two, I get exactly one half of the value here. And if I glue these vertices together, I get the same value. So if you know that the tropicality system is periodic for this, like for type D, then you can deduce that it's periodic for type A with initial data that's symmetric with respect to this involution. So now, how do you how do you do it for like a standard quiver? Um, well, here is a here is an explanation. So let's say I take this quiver that I showed you before, and it has a bunch of involutions acting on it. So one of them is switching these two vertices together with each other and leaving all the rest things fixed. So I have this involution and Therefore, I can sort of apply this duality map, and it's going to give me a tensor product, right? So I, I, I take these two vertices, and I put them into one vertex here, 
But then for all the address, I take two copies of those. So this would kind of goes here and here. And then you know, these two vertices go here and here. Right? So somehow, and then if you want to know about these dashed edges, so there is a certain technical thing that if, let's say, you have an, error, let's say you have an, an edge between two fixed vertices, right? then you make two copies of these vertices. And let me write it down. So you have an edge between two fixed vertices, and then you apply the duality map. You get two copies of these vertices. So you can connect them either like this, or you can connect them like this. And for each edge, I can I can choose it independently. So I choose I if I choose the cross cross thing, then I make the edge dashed. So that's why these two edges are dashed because when I when I go from this rectangle, I follow these two edges here, but then following the dashed edges takes me to another copy of this rectangle. So that's how you get the tensor product of type A. And this proves the periodicity if the values of these two vertices are equal to each other. But then there's another notion that flips this rectangle and it takes you to a different tensor product. And then from these two involutions you can deduce the periodicity. And you just do it for all infant families for, for standard specification. And we were lucky enough to have these involutions for each of these families. And for exceptional quivers, we just check the tropical periodicity by computer. Yeah, unfortunately, it, it takes very, very, very little time to check that by computer because it's tropical dynamics. So, yeah, the, the slides are going to be soon on my website, and the periodicity paper, as well as the others, is on the archive. And thank you so much for your attention. Do you have any questions or comments? So can you say something about the, the, the cases which involving a non uh, simply raised case? Uh, Do you understand my question? Yeah. yeah. So I think we didn't do anything with non simply raised I think there should be not that many difficulties, but I'm, I'm, I have tried. So maybe there are difficulties, but we did not. We tried on simply raised. Other questions? Well, I mean, that was in mostly my question as well, but uh, kind of as a quick follow up to that, since you're kind of folding, like in your example, you folded type A to type B or type C, and then you unfolded that to type B, I would imagine that you could probably do like a folding or as well. Yeah, yeah, I think so. Yeah, I think for the chapter of this, it should be. Yeah, I don't think there should be any because of this argument that you said right now. So, in in, in Cluster Zero Theory, a folding is not uh, necessary or all, all, all it works. Right. That, that is the problem. Yeah, I agree with that. But I think in this case, because we want, we only have to prove about tropical periodicity, mm -hmm. I think tropical is, behaves very well in yeah, the yeah. folding. <coughs> Other questions or comments? Did you, did you check in your linearizability business? Did you check the coefficients for the uh, Did you check? So, so you didn't talk about your linear. Yeah. In the next talk, I'm going to talk about the okay. extensively about the other two classes. Um, my question is about the coefficients in the linear system. Right. So, yeah, I'm going to tell you a formula for the coefficients in the linear recurrence for type A, tensor type A, so for like the cylinder. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. For that, we have a formula. For other tools, it's completely open. We have a classification of, by the way, we have a classification of all the classes that we have mentioned so far. So we'll tell you about that in the next talk. In particular, yeah, we have all these affine terms, fine tools, for which it's supposedly linearizable, but we have no idea, except for type A, how to do the coefficients. On Thursday, but. Thursday. Questions? Maybe one more. Do you have any uh, explicit, ex, uh, uh, explicit, dis, 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 
description of the linear equation for linear realizable case? Uh, yeah, well, only for type A. Uh, we, we do have for type A in terms of dominant timelines. But in general, we don't. Really. You don't, but uh, you can tell that there is a linear relation. Well, uh, conjecturally, yeah. Oh, it's a conjecture, yes. Yes. Oh, so I see. Our theorem is that if it's linearizable, then uh -huh. it's. Oh, I see. Conjecture. Right. I mean, you can check this on the computer. Mm -hmm. It always seems to work. Mm -hmm. Any questions, comments? If not, let's start the speaker again.